This is Caregiver Storyteller, produced by Caring Kind, the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Storyteller, a storytelling podcast about Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving. I'm Dr. Ann Kenny, and I'll be interviewing caregivers to get their stories about Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving. Occasionally, I'll also interview authors, advocates, researchers, healthcare professionals, and people with Alzheimer's and dementia to hear their stories too. So are you ready? Here we go. Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Edward Shaw to our show. Dr. Shaw is a duly trained as a physician and a mental health counselor. He was the primary caregiver for his late wife, Rebecca who was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease in 2007 at the age of 53. She died in 2016 after a nine year journey. In 2011, Dr. Shaw founded and directed the memory counseling program at Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The program serves individuals, couples and families affected by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. He's the author of several books, including Keeping Love Alive as Memories Fade, The Five Lang- Love Languages, and The Alzheimer's Journey, which describes his moving personal journey of caring for Rebecca, coupled with an innovative use of the five love languages in dementia counseling and care. He's also written the Dementia Care Partners Workbook, a guide for dementia care partners, providing understanding education, and hope for the long journey of dementia caregiving from diagnosis through the end of life. Dr. Shaw is now semi-retired, but is a part-time geriatric mental health counselor, leads several support groups for dementia caregiving, and a public speaker, educating and encouraging seniors, people living with dementia, and their care partners, medical and other healthcare professionals working in the fields of aging and dementia through his company, Empath Education. Dr. Shaw resides in Winston-Salem with his current wife, Claire. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. And um, if you don't mind getting started, I know that you've, um, as we we mentioned in your introduction, that you've had this big change from being an oncologist to a counselor. Um, and, I, and I would love to hear your story about that. Sure. So um, in my first career, I was trained as a radiation oncologist, and my specialty was um, brain cancer. So I treated adults and children who had brain tumors. I've had sort of a lifelong fascination with the human brain. So my parallel research interest was cognitive function in cancer patients, people affected by brain tumors, but also cancer survivors. Um, So even uh, women who had undergone chemotherapy for breast cancer and had this thing that we used to call chemo brain, you know, now it has a fancier name. But, But my whole career has been focused around diseases of the brain and understanding the brain. So um, so I moved from Mayo Clinic to Wake Forest University School of Medicine in the mid 90s. And about 12 or 13 years after uh, I had moved here, um, you know, I'm tooling along in my career and my wife, Rebecca, uh, uh, was a speech pathologist. She was a master's trained speech pathologist, high IQ woman, competitive swimmer no family history of Alzheimer's disease. She was the person who should have not gotten Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So one day we're sitting at the kitchen table, our three kids who are, you know, sort of teenagers at the time are tooling around the house. And we were reading um, magazines and she was reading US News and World Report. I remember this story like it happened yesterday. And uh, so at this time, she's only 53 years old. And she looks at me and she says, Ed, I've read this story three times and nothing is sticking. Hmm. And, you know, I knew from from my understanding of the brain that for a 53 year old to not be able to retain something that she's just reading was not normal. And and looking back, there were other things that had changed. 
very subtle things. So uh, Rebecca had this amazing sense of direction. We called her the human compass. I wish she, I had that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we would drive into a city. She would look at a map, memorize the major streets, and she could navigate us in a city that we had never been in. Wow. Right. So she had this amazing, like innate ability to remember like a grid work of streets and to navigate us. And she lost her sense of direction. Like before this memory incident, one day she got lost and she was sort of in a, the wrong suburb of Winston-Salem. And she called me and she said, somehow I wound up in Thomasville. I'm like 30 miles from home. And I thought, oh, maybe, you know, she made a wrong turn or whatever. You know how you just right. don't yeah. think about it. Your so, antenna weren't up yet. Right. Yeah, right. It, it just didn't put a send a signal up. But the other thing I noticed, and, and this is this is more of a, a personal thing, is Rebecca and I were one of those couples that were touchy feely. Mm -hmm. So we always held hands. We were arm in arm. You know, at that point, we had been married for 25 years and sort of, you know, it just the luster had not worn off like we we just were in love. And, you know, but that that sort of went away like she didn't seem to like want to hold hands or be arm in arm. And and I didn't it wasn't like I thought there was somebody else, you know, that that wasn't it's just that emotional side of our relationship changed. And once she said the thing about not being able to remember that, that kind of brought it all together. Gotcha. So, um, so we, we, with your training, did you, did you immediately think she must have a brain tumor? No, because she didn't have any of the other symptoms. Okay. <laughs> uh, so no, I actually, I immediately thought, oh my gosh, could she have Alzheimer's disease? Okay. Um, so one of my good friends at the medical center, you know, at Wake Forest where I worked, uh, we set up an appointment and he he saw her and she had some cognitive testing. And, you know, sure enough, she she had poor short term memory. She was already starting to have some executive function issues like multitasking issues. And he said, but, you know, no family history. She she shouldn't get Alzheimer's disease. So um, it turns out when I was at Mayo Clinic, we live next door to a guy named Dr. Ron Peterson. And Ron Peterson, you know, is a world expert on right, exactly. dementia, right? A I mean, great next door neighbor to have. A great next door neighbor. So, you know, our families knew each other. Our kids grew up together. Uh, and so he he had a baseline for Rebecca because, you know, we live next door for for all the years I was at Mayo, 12 years at Mayo before moving to Wake Forest. So we went and saw him at Mayo. And um, at the time she underwent a PETS, an amyloid PET scan, which was an investigational procedure at the time. We were able to get on like a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sadly her brain was full of amyloid. And he said, you know, I think, that she's on the pathway to develop Alzheimer's disease. And I remember we we um, we drove from Rochester back up to Minneapolis to fly home. And we kind of pulled over on, on it was Highway 52. Mm -hmm. uh, we live uh, off of the same Highway 52 in North Carolina, uh, ironically. And um, we talked about the diagnosis and what it means. And um, she just looked at me and she said, just promise me you'll always love me and you'll take care of me, mm -hmm. which of course was an easy promise. Yeah. And um, so we, we went back home and I remember um, you know, told the kids, like we were just all devastated. And, and I, I remember the irony of somebody you know, like somebody with a typical adult sort of malignant brain tumor has about a one in 20 chance of being cured. And, you know, she didn't even have that. Yeah. You know, it's a yeah. it, it, it's a progress. It was at the time there was no treatment. 
you know, no drugs available. And, you know, we knew we were on the pathway and, you know, Dr. Peterson said, you know, you'll live about eight to 10 years, Rebecca. And, and she did, she lived almost nine years to the day of that appointment at Mayo Clinic. Okay. And so I remember we got home and I looked for resources for the kids and I, because, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I was a brain tumor doc. I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's caregiving and the, the local Alzheimer's Association office had closed in Winston-Salem and there was nothing like there was no support. Okay. And, um, you know, I just remember, uh, I say that, you know, being a person of faith, these are like the taps on the shoulder I've gotten from God in my life. And, and you know, God said, well, you know, you can be frustrated by the lack of resources or you can do something about it. Yeah. And so you asked about the transition. That was really kind of the calling, the transition to say, you know, uh, you can you can provide that kind of support. Mm. The only thing is, you know, I was not a trained mental health counselor and I felt like that's the the degree I needed. Mm. So at the time I had all these administrative jobs. I was a department chair. I was deputy director of the cancer center, Wake Forest, like, you know, working 80, a hundred hours a week. But um, I had to make what I call the easiest, hardest decision of my life, which was to step away from all of that to be Rebecca's caregiver. And I did. Um, And um, I was able to, you know, sort of do a three year degree in mental health counseling, you know, study from home, take care of Rebecca and um, and so I eventually did get a master's degree in in mental health counseling with kind of a focus on grief and loss counseling. And, um, you know, I was still a faculty member at Wake Forest. So I switched departments from, um, from oncology to geriatrics. And um, I wound up um, working in the dementia diagnosis clinic and the dementia follow-up clinic, you know, with a sort of different scope of practice, but then started the memory counseling program, um, which uh, is a program uh, staffed by uh, both social workers and licensed professional counselors, licensed mental health counselors to really provide support for caregivers on the dementia journey and for people living with dementia who need that kind of support. Mm-hmm. You know, so we we serve mostly caregivers, but we also serve people living with dementia. That's beautiful. And, and I know that's one of the things that Karen Kind has adopted. So your book that kind of goes through that, you can see that I've I've put a few tabs in there to, <laughs> to, to tell me what I'm interested in. Um, and I couldn't stop. So the, the sticky note business has lost, lost a few sticky notes to your, your book for me. Yeah. Thanks. So my uh, my new boss in geriatrics said, you know, well, you know, uh, you you just need to make sure that you, you know, as part of of starting the center, that you provide resources. And so that's really um, I've had a, written a couple of different books, and and that one you just showed is is one of them um, as caregiver resources. So that's very different than the professional writing I did, you know, journal writing, yeah. like, like we do in medicine, right? This right. is more intended for um, both a lay audience. And then I write for healthcare professionals. Right. Yeah. And, and um, the, the book that we, you're just talking about the dementia care partners um, workbook is such a, a, a wonderful resource for, again, both people living with dementia, they can follow it as well, and the care partner to to find um, a path forward with a, a diagnosis that can be very difficult. Um, yes. I think what you mentioned with Rebecca, it it's a chronic disease, nine years, but also a terminal disease. So, you know, the how to live well when you're not in the terminal phase, but to live really well in that part that is is the chronic um i think yes. your book 
does a beautiful job of helping people kind of um, ground and uh, uh, show a, show that roadmap that Rebecca was so good at, um, kind of show those major roads that if you kind of get on the right path, you'll have an easier way forward. Yes. Um, I, I know that you're going to be speaking at Caring Kind soon about some of that path, those pathways um, coming up on November 15th. Today is the first day of November uh, 2023, so Caregiver Month. And um, I know that you're going to be talking to them about some of those paths. Would you mind maybe laying out a few of us, a few of those now? Or? Sure. No, I don't. I don't mind at all. Um, so, um, so. We, we began this um, this memory counseling program at Wake Forest. And um, so Wake Forest is a, an Alzheimer's disease research center designated by the National Institute of Aging. We see a tremendous volume of patients with dementia. We diagnose about 40 to 60 people a month mm -hmm. with dementia in our dementia diagnosis clinic. So the, the volume of families that came through our support program was large. And so in a very short time, as you know, I think back, we, we sort of started with two counselors working a half a day a week. And when I retired from the program a couple of years ago, we had seven of us full time. Wow. wow. So, you know, it, it became very busy, but about, um, five or six years in after we had opened the center and we had ramped up to have this huge staff, um, I got together with our team and I said, you know, I would like to write a book that would be very accessible for both uh, care partners and also for people living with dementia who are earlier on in the journey. Mm -hmm. Um a book that would be a resource to cover kind of all the major issues that a, a care partner or a person with dementia might encounter on this journey with, as you said, this chronic disease that, that doesn't have a cure. So we spent um, a number of brainstorming sessions and out of those sessions came what I call the eight central needs of dementia care partners. And that's the framework on which that book, the Dementia Care Partners Workbook is written. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the, there are eight central needs and more or less each chapter of the book covers one of the central needs. Okay. So, um, so in a way, we've already talked about the first central need, which is the need to tell and retell your story. So you've very nicely facilitated me being able to tell my story. And, you know, we, we sort of say that, um, that, that, uh, that storytelling is maybe at the core of what we do as mental health counselors and as medical professionals right? Uh, when we meet with a patient and a family is, well, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, it's an invitation to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And when you see someone over successive visits, like you do as a geriatrician, or I do now as a, a mental health counselor, the person is retelling their story, you know? And so, um, of course, the, the focus of the visit might be different of what you would do in a medical visit versus what I might do in a mental health visit. But the spirit is the same of telling and retelling the story. And I say that the, the core principle of, of this first central need and what I think the most important one is you need to feel it to heal it. Mm -hmm. Caregiving is a stressful experiencing having dementia is a stressful diagnosis. Absolutely. I was yeah. just with a caregiver um, in a counseling session before we were meeting today. And he was telling me that his wife, who's transitioning from sort of mild cognitive impairment to, to early stage Alzheimer's, that she has enough insight that she recognizes that she's losing her memory and losing her ability to multitask. And so um, I'm counseling him at this point, but
but I've invited him to bring her so she can begin to tell her story because you have to feel it to heal it. Mm -hmm. The second thing, if I just use this man as an example, you know, it, it, the second central need is the need to educate yourself. Right. And so, you know, there's a saying that we often fear the unknown. Mm -hmm. I think this is really true for both people with dementia and their care partners is they don't know what's next, right. you know, what's going to happen. So in the second and third chapters of the book, I talk about the brain and the stages of dementia. And, you know, I think even though you can't necessarily uh, prevent the disease from progressing, just knowing what's next and not being surprised by it makes it a lot less scary and makes it feel much more manageable. When I do trainings for mental health professionals, you know, I think often we we medicalize things and we focus on the symptoms, which is more or less what the person is having trouble doing, but we don't focus so much on what are the residual strengths. So, so as you know, a person who's living with Alzheimer's disease, often language is one of the later functions for them to use. And so, um, so you can use the, if somebody is having pretty normal language skills, then, you know, they might have trouble doing things with their hands or doing things that multitask, but, but if their language skills are strong, then you can maybe shift to more verbal kinds of activities. And so, so we use, I use that as a, a strengths-based approach, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's part of, um, that's part of where the education comes in too. Good. Okay. And do you want to go through any others or, I mean, again, I think another piece is your other your other book that I love, which is Keeping Love Alive as Memories Fade. Um, do you want to go into some of the emotional uh, connections? Sure. So um, so the the book Keeping Love Alive as Memory Fades, that, that was actually uh, my first book. Um, and it, it's just sort of an interesting side story of how that book came about. Um, uh, the pastor of the church that uh, that I attend is a, one of the pastors is a guy named Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote the original book, The Five Love Languages. And Rebecca and I had been to one of his seminars and uh, he autographed one of his books for us. And so we were familiar with the five love languages. Um, and so the five love languages is basically a kind of a simple toolkit to use for people, uh, mostly people in relationship, uh, couples, it can be used for families, parents and children, of how to emotionally relate to one another, how to love each other. Mm -hmm. So um, the five love languages are things like quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, doing things for the person, and then gifts. And so um, th these are, are ways that, you know, people connect with each other and some people connect with certain things better than others. So I mentioned to you, you know, Rebecca and I enjoyed physical touch in our relationship. That was a, a love language for us by holding hands or being arm in arm or, or kissing. And so what I found is, as I was working in the memory counseling program and uh, I did a lot of the couple's work that the relationship changes when a person is affected by dementia. And it's because uh, not only is cognitive function changing, but also how the person receives emotion and especially how they express emotion changes. Mm -hmm. And the person who, who has dementia is often less emotionally expressive. It isn't that they they don't need to feel loved. They may have more difficulty expressing their love for their partner or their adult child or grandchild or whoever. Right. Um, and often by the unaffected partner, by this, let's I'll just say in a couple, 
the spouse might interpret that as being, oh, they don't love me as much or they don't love me anymore. Just like I interpreted Rebecca's signal of not wanting to hold hands. It, it isn't that, you know, she was choosing not to hold my hand or be arm in arm. It's just that wasn't part of her thinking anymore. The thought of doing that sort of went away. Right. And so, um, and so we we often will teach care partners, it's not that the person with dementia chooses not to do something, it's that they can't do it anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, for somebody who, uh, a loved one with dementia who has repetitive questions, they ask the same question over and over. It's not that they're choosing to bug their spouse right you know, bug the H-E double toothpicks out of them by asking the same thing. For them, it's a new question. They can't remember. It's not that they won't, they can't. And that simple notion can be transformative for a caregiver to say, instead of, you know, getting upset with the same question 10 times over, they can say in their mind, oh, it's not that she is choosing not to remember, she can't remember. Mm -hmm. And so, I'll just answer it as calmly as I did the 10th time as I would have the first time. And, and I'm, I was journeying with my mother who lived with dementia. Okay. And when she was in a phase like that, um, it, by remembering the five love languages, I would, I would try a new way to come at the questions with a different love language. Um, because sometimes I, I think sometimes she, it was, she couldn't remember, but sometimes it was, she was just looking for some attention. And so then I would remember to come over and do some physical touch and give her a hug and, you know, say, Oh, you, you know, like I, I wouldn't necessarily answer the question the eighth time I would say, you know, we need to do some, like, let's, let's go read on the couch. You know? And I think what she needed was more like snuggle time on one occasion or, you know, another time, maybe she was just bored and she needed stimulation in a different way, but, yeah. um, by not feeling aggravated and really coming at it from a love language, um, as you, as you were counseling people, it, yeah. it, helped, it helped me kind of turn my, my mind to a softer place and, and start being more, more curious. Yeah, I, I love that story you, you just told with your mom, because my guess is that maybe in the moment you described, touch was helpful for her. But there may be there may have been other times when she might have been touch averse. Right, exactly. Yes. And I had to keep modifying that as as we went on our journey together. There was times where and she um, she lost her language very early. She had a mixed dementia with a vascular component and had a stroke mm -hmm. and, and lost her language. Um, but she could, I used to say to people that she could like orchestrate a symphony with her eyebrows and with the grimace or the, the whatever her mouth was doing spoke volumes. So when she was in kind of her physical verse adverse, she would like tighten her lips and be like, yeah. without saying back away, she would let me know back away. <laughs> right. And I had to, right, I, I hear what you're saying. I had to not be offended by that, but think what needs is she trying to communicate to me? And is there another way for me to show love that day? Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so for people who have language, if language is not a, a strength, but if it's a weakness, you know, so like with vascular dementia or maybe frontotemporal dementia, or even primary progressive aphasia, where the person might lose words, then um, communicating trust with eyes and with physical contact, you know, with touch um, might even trump the words. Right. Um, and so that becomes the strength that you focus on. And um, so I, I love the approach that Tipa Snow uses. Um, which really uh, where, where visual contact um, and then touch and just the approach she, she teaches to, to, you know, walking up to somebody living with dementia, I, th I think is 
uh, your example is is an example of of the that approach that she uses. So it's why why I like the love languages because you know you can it, it's such an easy thing to remember. You know, mm -hmm. is it time or is it touch or is it words or acts of service doing something or a little gift like a cookie or an ice cream cone or a piece of chocolate? You know that you can cycle through them and say, well what in the moment, like the story you shared with your mom, what in the moment is going to work? Because it could change, right? 10 minutes later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But if, again, if you're going, your intention is to have a loving relationship, it, it helps to have that toolkit. And um, I thought, you know, again, it was a, a beautiful book to help people kind of reframe where they are um, in, in their caregiving journey. So I'll, I'll tell another little story if I can. Um, oh, please. And this this is really, uh, this is the story of what motivated writing the Keeping Love Alive book. Uh, there was a point in Rebecca's journey, probably midway through her nine journey, nine year journey. Um, and I'm going to tell the full version of this story in New York in a couple of weeks, but she lost recognition of me. And... Um, just it happened overnight like one day she didn't know who i was and so i remember um you know that was that was the i think the most emotionally difficult moment of the 9 year journey even mm -hmm. harder than when she actually died of the disease mm -hmm. because at the point where that happened you know we had been together over 30 years, right? Married most of those years with three kids. She also lost recognition of our children, our three adult daughters as, as her children. And as best we could tell, her memory had sort of disappeared going back to like her middle school years. Like mm -hmm. she had no memory of college, graduate school, having kids, getting married. Um, and I remember, you know, the whole routine of of helping her get ready for bed and putting her to sleep completely changed when she didn't know who I was, right? right? Because she wasn't going to let this strange guy help her take a shower before she went to bed, help right. her put her pajamas on, tuck, right. you know, it just, it completely, it completely changed caregiving overnight. Mm -hmm. But I remember um, that um, and, and it brought a whole other set of challenges, agitation, wandering, resisting care, depression. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks, but um, but it it made it more difficult to have, you know, intimate moments in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so this is a topic and that's often not discussed you know, in our circles, right, is the loss of intimacy right. uh, between two people, you know, between partners in relationship when one person is affected by dementia. And I don't mean just sexual intimacy. No, right. I that, mean, a, that a, heart to heart connection that the heart to heart some, connection. some are able to maintain to the very end, but not everyone. But not everyone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what I had to, what, what I found is that I had to completely readjust my own sort of notion of relation, of relational intimacy mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of redefine it for Rebecca and I. And so what it evolved to, and I'll just describe, you know, kind of how the, the routine changed. So we had to bring it, bring a caregiver into our home. Mm -hmm. to help her with her nighttime routine, a, a woman, a female CNA, um, who Rebecca would allow, you know, get her ready to bed. And then it would be my turn to come in and she'd be all tucked in. And, you know, keep in mind, she doesn't know me as her husband, right. but there was a familiarity there. Mm -hmm. And she would let me kind of rub her face and I'd say, sweetie, you know, it's bedtime and I just want you to know I love you. 
and you're the best wife a man could have. It makes me emotional even talking about it now. Yeah. You're the best wife a man could have, and you're the best mom you could have been to our daughters. Remembering still, she's, you know, but there was like a little connection there. Mm -hmm. And I and I would, you know, just rub her face and I'd say, you have a good night's rest. And just remember, I love you and Aaron and Leah and Carrie love you. And I'll see you in the morning. And that was an intimate moment. Mm -hmm. Very yep. different. Mm -hmm. the, we were like intimate, courting again. <laughs> like courting again, yeah. Um, new new limitations, yeah. New limitations. But, so, still, but still pouring your heart out to her. Pouring, and, and you know, I did feel a connection, right? It wasn't Absolutely. a hug, it right. wasn't a kiss, but it was an intimate moment. And mm -hmm. so uh, so w when I'm with a group of caregivers and I tell that story, it's just, you know, you have to make a mountain out of a molehill sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and that can be true in this kind of intimate moment. And yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. It's one yeah, we friends. always have the choice to pour love on someone, right? That doesn't get taken away no matter what. It doesn't get taken away. And so, you know, that that brings me to one of the other central needs is the need to, to grieve your losses. Mm. And the dementia caregiving journey is, you know, I say it's one of the longest journeys of loss than a hum that a human being can experience because um because it's complicated mm. you know it's prolonged you lose the person in pieces it's ambiguous because for much of the journey they look exactly like they always have right they're not the same Right. And it can even be the, the term in, in grief counseling is disenfranchised loss right. because you can kind of lose family and friends because they don't understand this person who can't remember them anymore. So they choose, they're not comfortable being around them. Right. right. And right. so there's just, it, it's the most complicated kind of loss a, a person can experience. Yeah. And that's why we're we're so overt about it and talking about it in the Dementia Care Partners Workbook. Which is wonderful because again, um, mental health or and and Alzheimer's disease or the de related dementias is not necessarily a mental health issue, but I think <laughs> society sees it that way. Yes. Death and grieving are not, these are all kind of taboo. They're all kind of pushed to the oh, to the corners. Um, so I think that overt recognition, naming it almost in, in the beginning, when you said, I need to, I need to tell the story. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is another piece of that. I need to tell the whole story. Yes. Yeah. The good, yeah. the bad and the ugly. And yes. It's all in there. Yes. Right. It's all in there. And, um, uh, so th this brings up a notion that um, when I'm doing trainings with uh, mental health counselors, you know, not a lot of mental health counselors choose to go into geriatric mental health counseling, right? Yeah. Just like a lot of doctors choose not to go into geriatrics. Exactly. Or um, palliative care. Yeah. Or palliative <laughs> care. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it, there's a notion in counseling, um, in grief counseling called meaning deconstruction and meaning reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And th the idea is that in storytelling, you first, um, you have to kind of get the hard part out. Um, so what you just said really reminded me of this notion. And I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your comment a minute ago. You have to get the hard part out, you know, the bad and the ugly but often um, you're able to then reconstruct something new mm -hmm. that's meaningful. So in my story of saying goodnight to Rebecca, um, the, the bad and the ugly is, well, yes, yeah, she doesn't 
didn't know me as her husband anymore. And I couldn't be, I couldn't do the things for her that I love doing, like, you know, just helping meet basic needs like hygiene and getting jammies on. But I could relate to her in a new and different intimate way that, um, that though it, it, it didn't, you know, it's not like a hug and a kiss, but it, but it uh, filled my emotional love tank just as much. Yeah. And that's the meaning reconstructive side of it, you know, and, and so working with caregivers, working with families, you know, that, that these kinds of things is the process of, of counseling, right? right? You're not going to fix somebody in a 45 or 50 minute session, but you're going to walk with them on the journey mm -hmm. to sort of help them to to find some new meaning, even though in the big picture, right, the end of life is going to come. Right. And and in your story, in, in your beautiful story of, of reconnecting with Rebecca in a different way, um, you wouldn't have been able to reconnect had you not grieved thoroughly the loss of her recognition of you, her want to be intimate in the old way because you have you you have to let that go before you can bring on the new yes yeah 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 and people need i and i i don't think we it, we don't talk about that deeply enough that that you know you can have two things you can you can have the grief and the new beauty at the same time but you kind of have to loosen your hold on the grief a little bit to allow that the new beauty. Yes. You can't be holding it like, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to my grave with this one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, your, your natural counseling skills are, are coming out. And as we talk, I could, I could talk with you all day, but uh, th there's a, a, a type of counseling called acceptance and commitment therapy. You mm. just described it. Okay. <laughs> but, but it, but it's, um, it's the ability to hold two things, um, together that are sort of opposite of one another that you feel like can't be true at the same time, but yet they are, it's a, it's a paradox mm. and it's to say, uh, so the paradox for me was I am slowly losing Rebecca from Alzheimer's disease, but I can have meaningful relationship with Rebecca, even though she doesn't know me as her husband. Yeah. And those two things shouldn't exist together in the same space or in the same human being, but they can. And you're proof of it. And, and you're, Yeah. And then you can then yeah. teach others and with yeah. your counseling expertise and your medical expertise, you can say, yes, this is, yeah. and, and so, there you're the new roadmap for others then that, that there's a yeah. way forward that won't stop the terminal nature of Rebecca's disease, but it'll change how you get there. Yeah. And I think for for me, uh, people say, how can you do this work? You lived it for nine years. And, you know, um, I mean, I could have gone back to being a brain cancer doctor um, after she passed away. But um, but also uh, part of honoring her memory mm -hmm. is by, in a sense, her story, me telling parts of her story for the benefit of others. Yeah. And so um, she, she would be so honored by knowing that in her, that her life story has brought meaning and purpose to others' lives. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's really, um, you know, so often when, when people experience trauma or loss in their life, you know, meaning making is, 
part of the meaning reconstruction for them. And all kinds of nonprofit organizations have come from terrible tragedies, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and, you know, to name one, for instance. But yeah, that's that's what really compels the work for me is that that we, you know, you and I as healthcare professionals and different spaces, but of, of this same kind of a cohort of people we work with that we can really make a difference. Right. And so we make a difference like one person in one family at a time. So as we kind of wrap up, do you have, if you had one thing to leave someone walking on the journey with, what what might that be? Whether it's a person living with cognitive loss or or somebody supporting someone? I think um, oh, so, so many things, but um, uh, I, I have the, the privilege with my wife, Claire. So Claire lost her husband, uh, Jim, from Alzheimer's disease. He died just a few weeks after Rebecca did. And uh, she and I... Um, so this was seven years ago. We lost uh, Rebecca and Jim. We we married five years ago, and one of the things we share is is a meaning making exercise. Is um, we lead a support group for um, for people for dementia caregivers um, at at the church we go to, and uh, we had a group just a couple of weeks ago, and I think we had eight or nine caregivers there, and for whatever reason, they were all struggling with this, the same thing. Um, and that's what inspires my, the answer to, to the question. Okay. I think people who are on the caregiving journey really struggle with self-care. Yeah. So, you know, I say that caregiving is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And in order to have energy for that marathon, you have to to take time for yourself to rest. Okay. Um, and so I think that the, one of the central needs for dementia caregivers is the need for self-care. Uh, and the parallel central need is the need to ask for and accept help from others. And I, I think that the message that we had for our group a couple of weeks ago, and the message I was share, share with, with people who might be listening is, to be intentional, to carve some time out for yourself, whether it's a few hours, an afternoon a week, or a couple days a month where you get away, um, where, where you just do it. Like mm -hmm. it's the Nike philosophy. You're mm -hmm. just going to do it because you have to. Dr. Shaw, thank you for spending this time with me, with everyone. I I know it's going to help so many people in so many ways. And and I thank you for your books. I will we will link them um, in the show notes, and um, I highly recommend people read them. They're wonderful resources, um, and I can't wait to hear you. And I'm sure that the lecture will likely be available through Caring Kind um, on November fifteenth. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to share your story, go to caringkindnyc.org forward slash podcast. Maybe we'll use your story on the show. We'd love to hear from you. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave some glowing feedback. We love positive reinforcement. I'm Dr. Ann Kenny, and you're listening to Caregiver Storyteller, produced by Caring Kind, 